Hot Wheels. Brand new. This is an ad for Hot Wheels in 1969. And this is a Hot Wheels cartoon from the same year, making it the first cartoon made for an existing toy line ever. This piece of animation marks the debut of advertising as the product on screens, an art form co-opted by business aimed squarely at children to sell toys. And this guy is Martin Scorsese. Look, I have to start paying Don Lito protection. So everything you owe me, you owe him. He's made headlines several times over the past few years for, well... And their theaters were almost like amusement parks in a sense. So these films now, I think, are more like theme rides. What's more interesting than his quotes about superhero movies at large was the way he talked about his unwillingness to be involved in 2019's Joker. Todd Phillips and Joaquin Phoenix's take on the comic book character was artfully done, something Scorsese readily admits. Phoenix won Best Actor for his portrayal of the character, and Phillips has talked at length at how much Scorsese's work in films like Taxi Driver and King of Comedy influenced his movie. And yet, when asked about the Joker, Scorsese says this. I don't know if I, if I make the, uh, the next step, which is to this character developing into a comic book character, develops into an abstraction. That doesn't mean it's bad art. It could be, but it's not for me. Mm. Uh, and that's different from the superhero films. He comes from a time when the movie was the movie and that's it. Travis Bickle and Rupert Pupkin exist solely in their respective films. But the Joker has life outside the 2019 film's world. He was first unveiled as a comic book character in 1940, he's in video games, and he's a toy. And that's what holds Scorsese back. Travis Bickle and Rupert Pupkin were not packaged as a toy in the 1970s and 80s. They did not even exist outside the pages of their script. I'm the king. The movie was the movie, and the character was the character, and that's where they stayed. His era also predates the idea of a blockbuster film. For him, cinema is an end unto itself. The movies he loved growing up and the films he ended up making in the 70s that influenced Joker were art first and art second and art third. They weren't trying to lose money, but the box office wasn't the goal. Martin Scorsese is the old guard of Hollywood. He defends and goes to battle for cinema. He represents the idea of no toys. If the commercialization of films is a spectrum and Martin Scorsese sits all the way to the left on the side of no toys, Christopher Nolan represents a middle ground, a blend between art and big business. Nolan is as much a defender of cinema as Scorsese, still opting to shoot his films on film. And he frequently advocates for movie theaters, scoffing at streaming services and the idea of watching films on iPhone screens. But he's also a realist who understands the corporate machine and works within that system. Nolan was five when Jaws came out in 1975 and seven when Star Wars released in theaters. Unlike Scorsese, he's never known a world without blockbusters. And at the same time, he was 12 when King of Comedy released. He's grown up with these two different, vibrant cinematic realities. But just because he understands the corporate machine and works inside it doesn't mean that he doesn't have rules as to how that partnership goes. We were saying to them, well, yes, we understand that you need to make your lunch boxes, but you have to be really careful with that. And really, we need to be leading with the movie first. And that stuff needs to come later. Chris and I had many conversations with the studio about the fact that we really needed to be treating the film as the, as the thing. For Nolan, it's toys after. Jaws and Star Wars birthed the idea of huge summer movies with monstrous box office returns and a level of fanfare and hype that is now commonplace. But despite how much of an impact they had on the cultural landscape and the business of movie making, when they were being made, both Jaws and Star Wars were just movies directed by two filmmakers with personal visions. They are completely unlike the Hot Wheels cartoon that appeared on television a few years earlier. The struggle between the money and the artist is a tale as old as time, and certainly as old as cinema itself. They, they took the, my next picture away from me and butchered the end of it. I was going to show them that they were wrong. Disney's buyout of Marvel in 2009 represents a shift in that paradigm. Disney being the apex predator of corporations, of media entities, the idea of filmmakers with a personal vision has little to no room in a profit-seeking machine. The personal vision is replaced with a corporate one. 
This is why so many directors have to leave Disney projects citing creative differences. And it's why no matter how interesting the ideas presented in a Marvel film are, or how creative the filmmaking is, or how much of the director's own imprint shines through, they always get back on track by the third act. The ride always ends in the same spot. Marvel characters were intellectual property before being bought by Disney, but Disney is the undisputed king of IP. Intellectual property is what they do best. Disney characters cease to be merely characters. They are brands. Mickey Mouse might as well be Coca-Cola. And in 2009, Iron Man and the MCU effectively transformed into McDonald's. Movies are revealed like product releases. Instead of Steve Jobs unveiling the iPhone, it's Kevin Feige unveiling Phase One. These events are for the shareholders as much as they are the diehard fans. Profits have to constantly increase, which creates a never-ending need for new. New movies, new shows, new toys. Stuff. Lots and <laughs> lots of stuff. Marvel is everywhere, it's constant, and it can't stop. The MCU has been praised over and over again for how it expanded the format of movies, but really, it's an inevitable step for the corporation. Christopher Nolan, as a filmmaker and an artist, was satisfied with Batman's arc after one movie, and even more so after three. It wasn't set out to be a trilogy, and it kind of organically grew. Well, this was back in the quaint old days when <laughs> it was considered a little bit presumptuous to say, we're going to do nine of them in a row, and you're going to love them as an audience. You put everything into a film. There is something to be said for the level of payoff possible with 21 movies of buildup going into Avengers Endgame. The final conclusion of characters' arcs that have spent so much time on screen can be extremely satisfying and even moving. Where things get weird is between the big movies where things actually happen. That's where the lack of stakes for the characters is the most notable. Nothing could happen to Tony Stark in Iron Man 2 or 3 because he's got Avengers movies around the corner. There's something deflating and antithetical to art, to cinema, in having multiple sequels around the corner, eliminating death. Even if it doesn't happen, it has to be possible, or at least feel possible. The perfect example of this is in Avengers Infinity War. Thanos' snap was the most interesting thing to happen in the MCU. 50% of all life wiped out instantly, including half of the characters you know and love. Except they're not just characters, they represent billions and billions of dollars in Disney intellectual property. So they can't be permanently killed off. That's what destroys the significance of the snap. Not that it gets undone, Rather, that it could never have been permanent to begin with. It's both the pinnacle of stakes in the MCU and a spotlight on Consequence's unwinnable battle with shareholder profit. Consequence doesn't just mean death, though. A side effect of corporations' unquenching thirst for profits is the necessity to make mass appeal products. And mass appeal means making movies that parents feel comfortable bringing their children to, even young children. The violence in the MCU has a shiny Disney feel to it. The effects of backbreaking maneuvers has been almost entirely eliminated, even for characters that do not possess any form of superpowers. Well, I doubt that God from space has to take an ibuprofen after a fight. Take an ibuprofen. Take an ibuprofen. Take an ibuprofen. Take an ibuprofen. It's window dressing. Pain is usually just a grimace. Blood is limited to scratches and cuts on the face. Characters are occasionally stabbed, but the actual insertion won't be shown if they are human, or it won't be shown up close, and it will not feature blood prominently. These films don't lack violence at all. The MCU is incredibly violent. The hero's violence is usually directed at nondescript bad guys, often alien and robot. When their attacks are directed toward human enemies, there's often a dissonance between the action shown and the effect that action has. Captain America is a superhuman with super strength. He wields a shield that is essentially indestructible. When he throws it at everyday humans with significant force, they should be ripped in half or brutally damaged. Instead, they slump to the floor as if Black Widow knocked them out with a punch. The same lack of consequence is true for the big set pieces. One of the most egregious examples of this is in Avengers Endgame. The hero's base is completely destroyed with all of them inside, crumpling into rubble following massive explosions. 
and yet not a single one of our heroes, super or not, died, let alone suffered lasting injury. The dissonance could not be stronger. Incredible, jaw-dropping violence, sanitized of any and all consequence. Take an ibuprofen. It's the reason that schools in the U.S. felt comfortable taking middle schoolers as young as 10 to go see Black Panther on field trips. A film that is filled with violence, but the right kind of violence, the Disney kind. Critics picked up on the absurd lack of impact the city-destroying spectacles were having on the earth these movies take place in, so much so that Marvel decided to spend an entire movie letting characters debate the ethics of saving the day with collateral damage. It only took them 13 movies to get to that point, something The Incredibles does in the first 15 minutes of its runtime. This portrayal of action may seem like the only way to do things in PG-13 films because Marvel has been the dominant box office draw for the last 15 years and has greatly impacted the landscape. But it hasn't always been like this. Indiana Jones made hundreds of millions of dollars in the 1980s and Temple of Doom pushed the boundaries of the rating system at the time so far that they had to create the PG-13 label. Even then, the violence and gore in it is shocking compared to a PG-13 film that was released recently. The MCU is doing what Indiana Jones did, but in reverse, trying to appease parents by stripping violence of its reality. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man remains significantly more consequential with its violence than Marvel's outings have been too and not just in a gore for gore's sake kind of way. At the end of the film, in a harrowing sequence, Spider-Man and Green Goblin fight. The difference in tone and feel and the stakes involved is immediately apparent. And you spat in my face. <laughs> There's no score to accompany the action here. It's not an action scene layered with heroic music. This is life or death. Beefy sound effects echo after each blow lands. Spider-Man's suit is in tatters. Peter Parker is bleeding in several spots. When he's punched in slow motion, blood goes flying, something that is entirely absent in the MCU despite all the hand-to-hand -hand combat, stabbing and shooting. He cries out in pain, struggles to get up, moves slowly from exhaustion, it feels like he's in a real fight and that he could die. Not that it was going to happen, but it felt like it could, and that's what matters. That's what makes the fight so powerful, what makes his escape from death so triumphant, and the death of the villain, his once mentor and friend, so devastating. There's consequence and stakes and a reality to the action on screen, albeit a movie reality, but it's closer to the truth than the sanitized violence of the last 15 years. And it's not just Marvel. The best way to see the impact of the MCU on big budget movies is through the Fast and Furious franchise. What started as a fairly straightforward street racing story with just regular people has morphed into an international espionage action series featuring superheroes. As the series progresses, the lack of consequence for the characters gets greater and greater as the MCU continues to dominate the box office in the background. Fast and Furious makes its final transformation, transitioning from characters that appear to be superhuman in the way that they don't injure, to literally featuring superheroes in 2019's Hobbs and Shaw. The shrunken range of possibilities in the stories of the most mass appeal movie franchise of all time isn't limited to death or fallout from violence. Sex is decidedly absent from the MCU. There are few scenes containing any amount of eroticism whatsoever. On-screen partners kiss briefly before they go off to fight and after they return safe. It's usually the type of kiss a just married couple would give at their wedding. There are only two sex scenes in the entirety of the MCU. One is a moment in The Eternals, a more fringe entry in the series, and not coincidentally, one of the worst performing films in the franchise. The other is a passionate moment involving Tony Stark, the genius billionaire playboy philanthropist. This is from the first Iron Man movie, which is before Disney bought Marvel back in 2009. Also not a coincidence. After Iron Man 1, Tony mostly settles down, ditching the playboy life for monogamy. Even Tony Stark can't escape the Disney filter. 
outside of a few moments with Black Widow in the Iron Man films and the early Avengers movies, which were written by the chronically horny and allegedly unprofessional and toxic workplace creator Joss Whedon, the women of the Marvel Universe are not lusted after by the camera. Most blockbusters have a moment where a woman dons a bikini or strips down in front of her hero, something to put in the trailer. Curiously, the lustful gaze gets turned toward the men in the franchise. They take off their shirts and women admire their physiques, created by serums or freak accidents or blessed genetics. Thor is natty, by the way. It's a power fantasy. Disney is presenting a cleaner, more accessible version of the muscle-bound action star of the 80s. For the general movie-going blockbuster audience, which skews both male and white, male protagonists are presented as aspirational, who you should want to be like, while women are generally presented as who you should want to get. Women on screen in the MCU are largely not shown this way, though. Romance is often tacked on, with characters like Captain America going through the motions because blockbusters need to have at least the threat of romance. Love in the MCU is mostly awkward, stiff, or uninteresting. Despite the high-stress, high-stakes environment and the hero's peak physical condition, something the camera loves reminding you of, Disney superheroes don't have sex or anything that could be described as such. Mickey Mouse is presenting the perfect package for an America ruled by puritanical sensibilities. And really the world, straight characters kissing occasionally plays everywhere. There's no worry about offending governments overseas and denting reliable cash flows with whatever is going on with Steve Rogers and Sharon Carter. It's violence without consequence and love without sex. It all comes back to toys. In order to sell them best, Disney needs their heroes to function like their action figure counterparts. When kids play with them, throw them at walls, they remain intact, they don't bleed. And when two action figures are in love, they're made to kiss. At the end of the day, they're toys first. Like, you can't not like Marvel. It's amazing.